Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's program. My name is Devin Malone, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Today's program, Meet the Muses, provides us with a unique opportunity to hear from some of the incredible people whose likenesses have anchored the work of celebrated artist Kehinde Wiley, whose work is currently on view at the De Young Museum exhibition, Kehinde Wiley and Archaeology of Silence. To share more about our speakers, Inde Buri is a Senegalese and Cameroonian model based in Dakar and New York. Having recently graduated from the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, she's pursuing a full-time modeling career and works with clients such as ID Italia, Kehinde Wiley, and Mr. Easy. Her aim is to continue collaborating with talents in the creative and fashion space, both on the continent of Africa and the diaspora. Babakar Mane is a dancer and choreographer born and raised in Senegal. He graduated from the University of Arts in Senegal, and in 2020, he created his first choreographic solo, which won the VPLC Prize from the French Institute of Paris. Babakar really likes working with images, which is why he has collaborated with many visual artists and modeled for various brands. He is currently on a world tour with The Rite of Spring by Pina Bosch. Ruth Millington is an art historian, critic, and author specializing in modern and contemporary art which, with a focus on portraiture. In 2022, Penguin published her first book, Muse, uncovering the hidden figures behind art history's masterpieces, which aims to reframe the muse as an active agent in art history. Her children's book, This Book Will Make You an Artist, will be published by Nosy Crow in 2024. Last, but certainly not least, our guest curator, Soleo, has been hailed as an icon of Harlem and Harlem's heart and soul, an acclaimed creative curator, impresario, consultant, and muse. He seamlessly merges the worlds of art, fashion, literature, media, and music to document and amplify the stories of the emerging and underrepresented via exhibitions, events, and writing. Please join me in welcoming today's panelists, and thanks again for spending the hour with us. Hi, I'm Solio, your guest curator and moderator for today's talk, presented by the um, <clears throat> Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and Yale School of Art. Today, we will get to know two of the muses featured in the exhibition now on view, Kehinde Wally and Archaeology of Silence. In the exhibition, Wally created a new body of paintings and sculptures against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, and the Black Lives Matter movement. The artworks of Black people in often ambiguous states of pain, grief, sleep, or death reference iconic paintings of fallen heroes, lovers, martyrs, or saints. The works reflect on the violence against Black and Brown people and the silence around such violence <clears throat> through European art historical references. Central to Kehinde's works are the muses, whose faces and bodies you see in his works. Next slide, please. And for just a little further context, I'm also a Kehinde muse, having modeled for several of his previous works, including the one you see on the screen. Before we meet his other muses, I want to get started with art historian, critic, and the author of the book, Muse, Ruth Millington. Hey, Ruth. Hi, thanks so much for giving me this platform tonight. Thanks for having us. Now, hold up the book. Let's see the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just reminded me. Bring the book. There's the Muse book, which yeah. I made as well. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> so, Ruth, you know, we hear the term muse thrown around a lot. So please define for us what is a muse and remind us of their importance in art history. So thank you very much for inviting me to define a muse because this is a term I've been researching and writing about for over six <clears throat> years. And I feel like the dominant image of the muse today is really unfair. The muse has been mythologized and misrepresented both in art history, but also in popular culture and in films. And the stereotype of the muse is she's young, she's a white woman, she's probably taken her clothes off and she's posing naked in an older, great white male artist studio. And she's passive and has no agency. 
But in my research, I realized, hang on, this is absolutely not the case, both in terms of who is a muse, it's so much more diverse than that, and to also the role of a muse and what individuals have brought to the role is really diverse in terms of them entering into a really personal and creative relationship with the artist. So I would define the muse as a force of creative inspiration for an artist. And I wanted to bring this slide tonight to kind of highlight, this kind of sums up for me where we are with dis discussions of the muse. We have that kind of very central white woman with her long red hair, she's beautiful, but kind of tucked behind her is Fanny Eaton, a, a Jamaican born muse for a pre-Raphaelite, well, not just one, many pre-Raphaelite artists. And she was a paid model for them and really inspired a whole a whole movement of artists. And I think there's there's so many stories about muses that need uncovering, which is what I have tried to do in my book and written a whole chapter on you, Solio. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and you know, please <laughs> help frame for us Kahinde's history of working with muses and, and how integral that is to his own creative practice, specifically in conveying messages about Black identity and social justice. Well, yeah, I, I just want to go back to 2006 when he was working in a studio in Harlem and walking through the streets and came across on the floor a mugshot of a young black man and picked up this piece of paper, took it back to his studio, pinned it to the wall and began to create a portrait of this man who was anonymous in the photograph, apart from just a number from the New York Police Department. And Kehinde Wiley reframed this young man in his painting, really playing with light and elevating him to the status of some kind of icon, someone worthy of being represented as a muse and hanging in a museum. And that was really the start of his relationship with these kind of everyday muses, people who he would street cast then, meeting people on the streets of New York and also London, um, where I'm based, and inviting them to pose for him. And I know early on he was finding this quite difficult, but after you've painted Barack Obama, I mean, people are, are, are more happy to be painted by him now. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ruth, I know you're going to come back later for audience Q&A, so thank you so much for that framing. And now, please welcome our muses. Nde Burry is a Senegalese and Cameroonian model based in Dakar in New York. And Baba Carmenet is a dancer and choreographer born and, and born and based in Senegal. How are you both? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So on the screen are two paintings that you're both in. On the left, day uh, you're in the death of Hyacinth, and on the right is Barbara Carr and Young Tarantine One. For this <laughs> body of work, Wally, you know, foregoed his usual practice of street casting to find his muses. So how did you both get selected as muses? We'll start with you, Day. How did you become a Wally Muse? So I actually, um, I got a message on Instagram from someone from BlackRock, which is Kehinde Wiley's artist residency program here in Senegal, that at the time he had just inaugurated. And so um, it was from so someone from his team, but funny enough, um, I went to FIT in New York and being a fashion student and kind of being out and about in New York, I had met him once at, um, at an event that he had done with Drake and Sotheby's. And uh, so I had met him that one time, but uh, that's how I got, I got scouted was through social media from someone from his team. Wow, and how about you, Babaka? How did you end up being a Wally Muse? Uh, so for me, I was contacted by one of my friends with who I work on another project. And she's a teaching director at the Black Rock, which is the place uh, of residency that can do lay building Dakar. And uh, she told me that we are interested in your profile for a new can do lay project. And that's that's how I participate in this project. Very cool. So yeah. <laughs> In the film titled, How Kahinde Wiley's Reshaping the Monumental, he noted the importance of his attention to the details in his paintings, such as the sneaker brands, the jewelry, and the hairstyles worn by the muses to give a sense of the contemporary time period and sense of the individual. For both of you, what was the process of determining what you would wear and how you would be presented in these paintings? And we can start with you, Babakar. 
Um, you know, Chen Yule is someone who is very clear in his work. And uh, for me, his project is in, is in relation for, with the size, uh, the physical, uh, uh, the body language, and also the style. For example, I'm a, I'm a dancer. Uh, re representing me on a horse is more easier for me than some, some, someone who is not dancer. For me, Ken Ville was very clear of what kind of people or what kind of muse he wants. Mm -hmm. And the sneakers. So I noticed you wearing sneakers. Are they? Do you remember if they're Adidas? What kind of sneakers are those? And how how did you determine which sneakers would be worn? I think it's about my style also. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's worth like. She know exactly what she want and she just come and tell and tell us yeah, you you're gonna wear this, 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 and this. And mm -hmm. at the end, you know that when you see yourself, you are like, wow, uh -huh, I gotta start. <laughs> <laughs> and um and Day, how about you? How did you determine what you would wear? And even your hair, you know, it's a very um, you know, I love the hairstyle that you have. So how did you determine the presentation? Um, well, we were told to bring a few outfit options, but kind of outfits that represented us in our everyday wear. So uh, I bought, I think that day, like maybe two pairs of jeans, um, one skirt, a simple top. I brought a sweatsuit, but kind of me in my element, in my comfortable element. And I think it, it represented well in the painting because we were ourselves, but we were kind of elevated to this regalness. So I love the contrast of us kind of wearing everyday clothes, but in, in a regal position with a regal painted background. So um, I kind of just brought things that I would wear every day um, that represented my personal style. Yeah, and I remember when I um, modeled for him, it was very similar. It was like bringing some things you have of your everyday style, but he also had a couple of pieces um, that we could choose from as well. Mm -hmm. and so I chose yeah. a few pieces to add. Yeah, so that was similar for you guys. There was stuff there and stuff you mixed in with your own. Pretty cool. Exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, Wally saw an opportunity to have these works brought in the conversation to really emphasize the shared experience across the diaspora for Black people uh, experiencing state violence. Um, so how did the Black Lives Matter movement resonate in your own personal lives? And we can start with you, A. I think for me, I remember at the time um, when during the pandemic, during the lockdown, I was in London at the time. And it was, it was of course, a scary time. But on top of that, to have um, us all being in the house, I think it put a more, more of a focus on the realities of this police brutality that people were facing and injustices, even being in London, you know, I felt that all the way happening in the in the US. And for me, I think it was something that I think a lot of Black people across the world, we've been, it's been a shared feeling for a while. And it just seemed like in that moment, because everyone was at home and more eyes were on what's happening out in the outside world, it was, a, it was kind of an awakening moment where I think it really shocked people to their core of like, you have no choice but to wake up, but to realize the injustices that are happening. So I think it was a wake up call for others that maybe before um, these scenes were sheltered. Um, but for me, it was definitely deeply personal. And I think I just felt very helpless, also physically being at home, not being able to to um, to voice ourselves like we would usually, um, but I still managed to, there was a Black Lives Matter protest that was held in London. I still managed to make that. So I, I felt that even though I was away from the US during that time, I was still able to to share my solidarity. And Babakar being, you know, in Senegal, um, you know, how did the Black Lives Matter movement resonate in your life? Yeah, you know, uh, as an African, I felt, I felt my, my personality and my human dignity was violated through this event of George Floyd. Uh, even it is true that the life of Black people have always been complicated in America. But this murder confirmed that Black people are not always respected. And as, as a Black man, I feel the same pain and, and sadness as everyone else. Yeah, and, I, and I think that's that's part of the 
the the the beauty of Wiley's work is that it creates that connection across the diaspora and across you know people who are not part of the the black diaspora to also empathize and relate and understand the experiences. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so on the left is Day and in the Virgin Martyr Cecilia, and on the right is Baba Carr and the body of the dead Christ in the tomb. As we see in these two sculptures, the works deal with very heavy subject matters such as grief, loss, death, and systemic violence. Um, so how did you both mentally or spiritually prepare to serve as a muse and convey these really heavy emotions and experiences? And we can start with you, Dave. What was nice is that on set, um, Kehinde was there kind of maneuvering and helping us um, understand, especially the different poses that we would do, the different positions we would be in. And he'd always give us um, kind of a backstory and a reasoning, especially because I think as a model, sometimes you're just told, okay, convey this expression, pose this way. And it seems more statuesque and almost like a facade, but I really felt in that moment, him giving me a reasoning as to why I was, you know, lying down in the certain way, posing in the certain way, what, what it was trying to evoke. Um, it, it really helped me prepare mentally as well. And I think a lot of the poses we held for a little bit as well. So I think staying longer in positions, you kind of start thinking to yourself and getting into character deeply than you would say a quick pose. So I think I, I had time to, as in the sculpture, I was kind of lying in a very kind of con constructed position. Um, I had time to kind of just have a moment for myself and just be with my thoughts and be like, you know, what, what am I feeling in this moment? What does this represent? And like you said, it's representing grief. And I felt that a bit in that moment. Wow. <laughs> and how about you, Baba Carr? You know, this, you know, you're um in a tomb, isn't it? <laughs> so, you know, that's a lot of people, you know, if you're claustrophobic, that's one thing that's like, oh my God. <laughs> so <laughs> how did how did you mentally prepare to uh depict this 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 grief, this loss, this this death? Uh, for me, it wasn't too complicated because I just had to represent the story behind the image. And yeah, sometimes you have to concentrate on yourself uh, to find the emotion that goes with this, with the, the story. Mm -hmm. For me, that it was very important to know exactly what I'm doing and to take time to be inside of myself and to, yeah, to, um, to, to let the, the emotion on give me what, what the, the image needs. Yeah. yeah, and I think what you both said about Willie tapping into how he gives you the backstory and as you're holding the pose, you you really have to reflect. You know, you're thinking about, wow, what what were, what was the person who went through this experiencing? Um, so it really makes you think, especially when he's talking about state violence and it makes you really think about what someone like a George Floyd or Brianna uh, tale of what they must have been feeling in those moments. Um, so it's really, really powerful. Um, and it's because of your emotions that it is part that it helps to convey that. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, Day, you're a professional model. So how has this process of being amused in these works, how is it different than your usual modeling gigs? And you mentioned because, you know, you're getting more into the backstory, but is there another element that's really different for you? I think it really amplifies the emotion factor for me because I always say that modeling is kind of acting in still form. So every time I shoot for a photo shoot or a brand, I'm, you know, oh, this is, you know, handbag. It has an identity. It's happy. It's social, et cetera. Um, but I think for my first time posing for artwork, um, it amplified the emotion because it's, it's, it's like a photo that's immortalized and can be kept forever, but I feel like art is kind of a step above that, a step above photographs, because it's something that when we think about photographs from years before and artwork from years before, we have artwork from more than thousands of years ago. So for me, it was extra special because it was kind of amplifying that character and that emotion that I know this is something that in the year 3000 and something is still going to be around so it was just a little bit extra special yeah and I, and i think i think to your point you know there is something elevated about the art and you know i will say you know there are a 
photography works that are just as impactful. But I think I think what you're getting at is the commercial, the difference between the commercial brand photography versus the artistic photography and, and how that exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. Um, and Barbara Carr, you know, your background as a dancer and choreographer, you know, how did that <laughs> help? Or how was that a challenge when being amused for these works? Because I'm looking at your, your pose on the screen and it's like almost as if you're in motion dancing, but on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, um, as a dancer and choreographer and model, I have uh, worked on many international projects. Uh, and I think that this experience that I had, that I had helped me a lot to accept the challenge, uh, you know, to be a muse for this project, because it was like the first time I did the, 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 the muse and it was a challenge for me, but you know, if you, if you already work on, on a project similar of this one, uh, yeah, it was not very complicated, yeah. And if, um, what was the challenging part? You said there was a challenge. What was the challenge for you? The challenge is uh, to be me, you know, to not be uh, focused on the, the the picture or to or to not be focused on what can really want, but to be focused on what I can give through my emotional, you know, or through my through my body, what I can give, how I can represent what what he really needs. Yeah, and I love that. I love that point you brought up because it reminds me of something in Ruth's book. And we could remove the slides now um, about how um, it's a it's a dialogue, right? It's a give and take between the muse and the artist in that moment. Yeah, he gives the backstory and tells you what he's looking for, but you may move slightly this way. He may be like, "Oh wait, hold that! I didn't I didn't think yeah. of that." You know. So yeah, there's a a, um, a communication between the two between artist and muse. Um, my final question for you both before we get to some rapid fire questions. Um, in the A4 Mission film, Kahende said that the work in this show is about the desire, <laughs> the desire to be seen, the desire to be alive. For both of you as muses, how does being in these works make you feel seen and alive? And what do you hope people take away from the experience? We'll start with you, uh, Baba Khan. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm agreed with him. Uh, for 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 example, for me, you know, um, uh, this being a measure of this project, uh, they're gonna take my name to the greatest museum around the world, you know, and also inscribe my name in the story of contemporary Afro-American art. And for me, it is to be alive forever. And I'm very agreed with for with what he said. And how about you, Day? How how does this make you feel seen and alive? And what do you hope people take away from the pieces you're in? I think the yeah, one thing that I see looking at these artworks, I try to remove myself from it and other artworks is that he's done is just how blackness is so beautiful. I think he's one of maybe the first and only artists that I know, at least contemporary artists that I see celebrating blackness in such a regal way. And I think that being an artwork and painting, it like Babakar said, it gives us life forever. So even when our physical bodies are no longer here, our joy, our smiles, our light, it's always going to be around. Also for other people to experience as well um, by viewing them and, and interacting with them. So I feel seen in the literal sense that I, I feel that my my being is going to be eternal, which is which is really beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Um, so now for some fun rapid fire questions, just to get to know you both a little better. Um, so here we go. <laughs> what is one interesting fact about yourself? Day. Uh, well, I moved around a lot when I was younger. So I've lived in what, seven different countries between the Caribbean, U.S., Europe, and, and Africa. Baba Carr, one interesting fact. Uh, for me, I just want to say one, you know, something very funny. When they when, when they told me that Ken Hule was interested to your profile to be a muse for his next project, I didn't sleep all the night because I was so excited, you know, <laughs> like, wow, this is like the 
the most incredible thing that's happened to me this year, you know. And it's very funny for me when I think about this this, this moment. Yeah. Wow, so you didn't sleep any night. You, you got no rest the night before your modeling for Kanye. Uh, maybe 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 I slept like one hour, but oh my god! Every time I every time I wake <laughs> up, I, I I check my phone. I was like, oh, okay, it's my time. <laughs> how did you? How did you? How did you have the energy? Um, <laughs> so name one thing you enjoy the most about being a muse. Jump in. Papa Car, one thing you enjoy the most about being a muse? Something I enjoy is to to see to see my, my myself through the story. And they? Um, if I can piggyback off of that, seeing myself through someone else's eyes. Cool. And name one thing you enjoy the least about being a muse. I have a feeling for Baba Car is not getting rest. <laughs> 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 what's but really Babaka, what's the one thing you enjoy the least about being a muse? Uh is to stay one position for 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 an hour for an hour. You know, you are like this for like one <laughs> hour and a half. <laughs> and I know. <laughs> that must be really hard for a dancer as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. That was going to be my answer because I would have said that for Babacar, it's easier being a dancer. You have more flexibility. I'm not as flexible, but definitely holding the positions, it teaches yeah. you a lot of discipline. <laughs> okay. And then, um, <laughs> mm -mm. and I'm going to ask Ruth to come back on camera screen and answer this last one as well. Um, so finish the phrase, to be a muse is to be. And we'll start with you, Baba Carr. To be amused is to be alive. Alive? Yeah. Thank you. Ruth, to be amused is to be? Inspiring. And Day, to be amused is to be? Authentic. I love it. Ah, oh, this is great. Well, you know, I just want to thank our audience, our speakers, um, the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco team and our co-presenters, the Studio Museum in Harlem and Yale School of Art. Um, please visit famsf.org for updates on future events. Thank you all so much for this conversation, getting to know the muses. Um, and to everyone, goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.